Hello everyone, I'm Sung Hoon Lee, and today I'll be talking about the post-quantum security of proofs of sequential work. This is a joint work with Jeremiah Blocky and Samson Zhou. Let me motivate you with the following example. Suppose that you are an instructor of a large class and you proctor the CS590 final exam online on Zoom due to the pandemic. It's a two-hour exam, but after the deadline, a number of students sent you emails telling about their excuses of submitting the solutions not on time. So as you can see here, a student named Sincere Goodman turned in the solution five minutes late due to an unexpected internet connectivity loss. Another student named Liar King has a longer story. While taking the final exam, his cat accidentally chewed out his Ethernet cable, and after calling maintenance, the repair guy was assassinated on his way, and then a severe tornado struck his town, which delayed significantly for a long time to fix it. He is late for two weeks, but he is arguing that he has not made any changes for the solution after the deadline. And a couple more students here, Quantum Cheat, Full U, etc. Then you might want to distinguish between the cases, whether the students are telling the truth or the students are lying and taking advantage of extra time to work more on the final exam. Then what would be a wise way to not to be fooled by dishonest students? One good solution is proofs of sequential work, which is basically a proof that requires a large amount of sequential work say n steps, after a prover commits an initial message, where a message can be the solution for the final exam, as we saw in the previous example. Then how do we construct proofs of sequential work? An initial approach is an iterative hash chain. For example, an honest student, sincere good man, might start hashing his solution file on his local machine right after the internet was down hashing and hashing again until the internet is back. If hashing it one time takes one second, then it should be h to the 300 for a five minute late solution, and then he submits h to the 300 of solution, in addition to the solution file itself. If full u is 24 hours late, then it should be a hash chain of length 86,400. It's a quite simple and straightforward approach, but one big disadvantage is that the instructor needs to recompute the whole thing to verify whether the output is, is an actual long hash chain or not. And if there are lots of students who have sent you the file late, then you definitely would not have enough computational resources to verify all the solutions and give them letter grades on time. Therefore, we need additional requirements for the proofs of sequential work. First, efficiency. That is, instructors should be able to quickly verify all the proofs in time polylog n. And second, soundness. Students should not be able to produce a valid proof faster than sequential time omega n, even if running in parallel. There have been a number of constructions of proofs of sequential work. The first theoretical construction was developed by Mahmoudi et al. with verifier time polylog n and prover time omega n as desired, and the construction is secure against parallel attackers, and finally, security proof is in the classical random worker model. Later on, Cohen and Peterzak gave an improved and more practical construction. They gave a modular security proof in the classical random oracle model. That is, they showed that any parallel cheating prover for the proof of sequential work must produce a long H sequence with high probability. And second, any parallel cheating prover running in time less than n cannot produce an H sequence of length n with high probability, which implies that combining those together, cheating prover cannot produce a valid proof of sequential work except for the negligible probability. And here, an H sequence is a sequence of binary strings such that for each i, the hash of xi minus 1 is a substring of xi 
as you can see in the figure below. So, Cohen and Petrzak showed a strong relationship between an H sequence and a proof of sequential work, and they reduced the problem to find a long H sequence. These are really cool results, but in both work, security proofs are in the classical random work model, so a natural follow-up question is if the security is still guaranteed in the quantum random work model. And for this work, we focused on Cohen and Peter Zak's construction. Since their security proof was split into two parts, we extend these questions to the quantum random work model. So our key research question for this talk is whether a sequentially bounded parallel quantum attacker can produce a long H sequence and produce a valid proof of sequential work. For example, suppose that the student quantum cheat who submitted the solution around three hours late has a state-of-the-art quantum computer. If it is possible to produce a valid proof of sequential work faster for a quantum attacker, then quantum cheat might take advantage of extra hours to work on the final exam and can produce a valid proof much faster using his quantum computing power. Fortunately, the short answer is no. So our main result can be summarized as follows. First, we proved that a quantum adversary making Q queries over n minus one rounds can output an H sequence of length n only with, only with negligible probability. And here, we emphasize that the number of rounds is n minus one, which is less than the length of an H sequence. And second, a quantum adversary making Q queries over less than n rounds then the adversary outputs a valid non-interactive proof of sequential work only with negligible probability as well. Here, we would like to note that we give a direct proof for the non-interactive version of the proof of sequential work from Cohen and Peterzak, which can be obtained by applying fiat shamir transform, and then our proofs are in the parallel quantum random work model. We also want to remark that there is a concurrent and subsequent work by Chang et al., which also gave a comparable security bounds for the proof of sequential work in the parallel quantum random work model. Now, let me briefly recall Cohen and Petrzak's construction of a proof of sequential work. It is basically a complete binary tree, but with some extra edges added. We highlighted the extra edges in blue so for each leaf node v, we add an edge from u to v for any u that is a left sibling of a node on the path from v to the root epsilon. For example, if we look at node 111 at the bottom, the path from 111 to the root is as follows. So we add an edge from each of its left sibling. So we add an edge from 110 to 111, from 10 as well, and finally, 0 to 111. And each node has a label, which is a hash of its parents. And here, we include the message chi and the node itself to the hash computation for the ease of verifying the proof. So the verifying process can be done by checking the Merkle tree commitment, which is the label of the root node as highlighted in purple. So the verifier can force the prover to open certain labels and check local consistency. For example, suppose that we have the following Merkle tree opening. Then the verifier would check if they are locally consistent. Here, we say that a node is locally consistent if the label of the node equals the hash of its parents. So in this example, we can check that node 110 and 111 are locally consistent since the parents of node 110 are node 0 and 10, and we have Merkle tree opening information of them, and similar for node 111. And then we check the local consistency along with the path to the root, so we check that node 11 is locally consistent, and we can proceed to node 1, as we have information about the node 10 from Merkle tree opening, and finally, we can check that the root node epsilon is locally consistent. And then we note that the label of the root is the proof of sequential work for the statement chi. 
The audit process can be either interactive or non-interactive by applying Fiat-Schmidt transform. And recall that in CP18, they showed that any classical attacker for the proof of sequential work running in time less than n must produce a long H sequence. So proving the hardness of producing a long H sequence is strongly related to the security of proof of sequential work. Now, let's talk about the parallel quantum random work model. So in the classical random work model, when an adversary makes a query x to the random work h, then he gets the output h of x. And for the rest of the inputs that were not queried, the outputs can be viewed uniformly at random. But in the quantum random work model, the adversary can make a superposition of queries, and then he also gets the output as a superposition of the hash outputs. The security proofs are much more challenging in the quantum random work model, and the useful properties of the quantum random work model, such as programmability and extractability, no longer apply in the quantum random work model. It was not even easy to record quantum queries without the adversary detecting, since as soon as we measure the superposition of states, it just collapses so that the adversary will immediately notice that something is happening. Back in 2019, Zandri introduced a compressed oracle technique to overcome this recording barrier by changing the view that the adversary interacting with a random oracle is indeed entangled with superposition of oracles with some phase shift. And then Zandri introduced the compressed phase oracle, which can be used equivalently as a quantum random oracle. So here, we have a database D consisting of input-output pairs, and classically, the database only consists of known input-output pairs, and if they are unknown, then they simply don't appear. But in a quantum setting, the query output will be a superposition of possible hash outputs, so the database will contain known input-output pairs along with indeterminates. So after making two queries to the random oracle, the state can be viewed as follows, where x, y are query input output registers, and z is an algorithm state, and d is a compressed database of at most q input output pairs. So we can extend this compressed oracle technique to the parallel quantum random oracle model by defining the oracle C phase oracle k. Let's look at some examples. In this talk, we will only consider the simplest case where x, y is not in D for the ease of the presentation, so please see the paper for handling other cases. So in the sequential quantum random work model, when applying C phase oracle, we will have the following state, and we add x, w to the database D, where w ranges over all possible outputs of h of x. And for the parallel query case, we apply C phase oracle K instead, and we will have the following state, and we add x1, w1 through xk, wk to the database D, and here we only give the simplest case as well, where all the pairs x1, y1 through xk, yk are not in D and all distinct, and wi's range over all possible outputs of h of xi's for each i. Again, Please see the paper for handling other cases. I think we are now ready to illustrate our main result. Recall that we want to show that it is hard to produce a long H sequence in a quantum setting, and for that, we have some helpful notations here. Given a database D consisting of Q entries, we define a directed graph GD with Q nodes, where we have an edge from node VXI to VXJ, if and only if in the corresponding database, the hash of xi, which is yi, is a substring of xj. So intuitively, a long path in gd corresponds to a long h sequence in the database d. We define two sets. Path s is the set of databases such that gd contains a path of length s. And second, we define path s twiddle to be the set of basis states where the corresponding database is in path S. 
So we can say that D contains an H sequence of length S if and only if D is in path S. So it'll be helpful to keep in mind that if D is in path S or if some state is in path S twiddle, that implies that there is an H sequence of length S in the corresponding database. So here, we introduce the core lemma to prove our main result, which says that for an initial state phi and the resulting state phi prime after applying C phase oracle K, the difference between L2 projection onto path S twiddle and path S plus one twiddle is negligibly small. So the lemma basically means that if we start with a state that is nearly orthogonal to path S twiddle, then even after applying a parallel quantum queries, the resulting state is still nearly orthogonal to path S plus one twiddle. So the basic proof idea is to split the states into the good and the bad part. And again, in this talk, we will only present the simplest case where all xi's are distinct and not in D. Then if, after applying C phase oracle K, we will have the following state, and we will split them into two parts, where W1 through WK are good and bad. Here, the bad set is basically when D is not in path S, but the resulting database is in path S plus one. So what we want to argue is that the fraction of the size of the bad set is negligibly small, which implies that if D is not in path S, then after one parallel quantum random oracle query, the resulting database is still not in path S plus one with high probability. So in this talk, we will give a simple example to give you a flavor of what's going on here. So if you're interested in the formal proof, please see the full version of our paper. Suppose that the database D contains six entries as follows. Then we can create a directed graph GD, and we can see that since Y1 is a substring of X2 and X3 as highlighted in red, we will have edges from node one to two and one to three also highlighted in red. The rest of the edges were created in the same manner. So if you pause the video and check one by one, then you will see how all the edges were added due to the substring relationship. And here, I want to note that the longest path is 5, 2, 3, and 4 of length 3. So we can say that D is in path 3, but not in path 4. So after a quantum random oracle query, the resulting database D1 will be bad if D1 is in path 5. Suppose we have one query x7, then we will update the database by adding x7, w to the database, and it'll be a superposition over w. So if we visualize this in GD, it'll be something like a superposition node vx7w. And by adding a new node, we will automatically add extra edges based on the substring relationship. So as highlighted in red, since y1 is a substring of x7, we will add the edge from node 1 to vx7w. And for the same reason, we will add the edge from node 4 to vx7w as well. In this case, we only have two edges to add. Now it seems clear that if these are all the edges to be added, then the resulting database d1 is not in path 5, since the longest path in GD seems clearly to be of length four, because we added at most one edge from each node with the same direction. However, we have one bad case if there exists some back edges from VX7W to some of the existing nodes. For example, if W is 1010, then it is a substring of X1, so we will have the blue dashed edge from VX7W to node one, which makes the longest path longer than of length four. So if there is a back edge, then it immediately implies that D was not in path four, but the resulting database D1 is in path five, which is not what we hoped for. And the key observation here is that the fraction of such Ws is negligibly small, 
So the fraction of the bed databases is also negligible. Now for a parallel query, say x7 through xk plus 6, so we have k parallel queries in a single round. And again, in this talk, we will only present the simplest case where all the xi's are not in D and all distinct. Then the resulting database dk becomes the following, where we add x7, w7 through xk plus 6, wk plus 6 to D. And in the graph gdk, we add k superposition nodes and some extra edges added due to the substring relationship. Now we have one more bad case. Since we have multiple superposition nodes, there is a chance of internal edges between vxi wi's, and we still have the possibility of having back edges. Another key observation is that the fraction of such wi's is negligibly small for each i, so the fraction of the bad databases after a parallel query is still negligible. So what we have shown from the previous example is that after making k parallel queries in a single round, the difference between L2 projection is very small. And throughout n minus 1 rounds, we can make ki parallel queries in each round with the total number of queries at most q. We apply triangle inequality to show that the adversary can measure a database in path n after n minus 1 rounds only with negligible probability, with order of q cubed over 2 to the lambda. That is, the adversary can produce an h sequence of length n only with negligible probability if running in sequential time less than n. Note that we only considered the simplest case in this talk, so please see the paper for the full security proof if interested. And another main result, the security of a non-interactive proof of sequential work is basically a similar argument using the previous result, so the details can be also found in our paper. So let me wrap up the talk. First, proof of sequential work allows a prover to convince a resource-bounded verifier, a professor with having a small laptop, that the prover invested a substantial amount of sequential time to produce a valid proof, so that the students cannot fool the professor. And we showed that any parallel quantum random workload attacker running in time less than n cannot produce an H sequence of length n except with negligible probability and cannot produce a valid non-interactive proof of sequential work except with negligible probability as well. We have several open questions. First, we would believe that the security bounds can be tightened by reducing the numerator from q cubed to q square. And another open question is that since we can only extract lambda over log n challenges from the CP18 construction, we currently need lambda to be log n times larger to guarantee the same level of security. So we'd like to come up with a way to extract more than lambda over log n challenges from a single random workload output and establish the security of proofs of sequential work for larger value of Q. And somehow it is very counterintuitive, but it is quite tricky to prove security in an interactive version and then apply Fiat-Shamir in the quantum random work model. So we are interested if we can prove for an interactive version as well. And we proved only for the CP18 construction, but since we haven't exploited any particular properties from their specific construction, we think that we can extend our security proof for other proof of sequential work constructions, though they still remain open. Finally, it'll be great if our proof technique can be extended to other cryptographic primitives, such as proofs of space, memory hard functions, etc. These are the references, and that's all I got. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to taking any questions at the live session of ITC. Thank you.